You're listening to the Surgeons of Horror podcast. Hello, welcome to the Surgeons of Horror podcast. Its mission is to go out there and dissect and discuss horror movies, both old and new. And on the odd occasion, we have the uh, privilege of chatting to some people in the industry, which uh, today's podcast is no exception, as we have cinematographer Simon Chapman with us, who worked on films like The Loved Ones, Killing Ground, and The Devil's Candy, to name just a small touch of of some of the work he's done over the years. Before we kind of uh, welcome him to the podcast, I should say to yourselves out there that I'm your host, Paul Farrell. I'm joined with uh, the Big Cheese. Big Cheese. Hey, and... Hey, the mum was back. How are you going? I'm good, man. How are you going? I'm good. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for joining us. And um, let's just cut to chase and welcome Simon on board on this. Um, welcome, Simon. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Simon, I noticed that um, looking uh, your, well in your own DB credits, and I'm not sure how kind of correct these are, but the horror genre does appear to be uh, something a bit of a calling card for you. And I noticed in those credits that you've worked on uh, a documentary that was associated with the House of Wax remake back in 2005. Um can you tell us a bit about this role and how you got involved with that? But more importantly, what the horror genre means to you. Yeah, sure. Um, it's it's funny you bring that up. I haven't thought about that for quite some time. I was basically, um, I was employed by the producers of House of Wax um, to shoot a behind the scenes. I wouldn't say it was focused on the movie itself. I would say it was focused more mm. on Paris Hilton and Paris Hilton's okay. uh, exploits around the making of the movie. So this was this was a show for MTV, sure. and, and I and I was just fresh out of film school, kind of ish. And um, someone I knew up in Queensland, a cinematographer up there that was doing it, uh, he asked if I could share the load. And um, it was four weeks of living with Paris Hilton, to be honest, and and <laughs> <laughs> heading, heading to right. all sorts of parties um, and limousines and Ferraris and sort of experiencing a life that was so completely removed from what my life was and what my friends were like. But at the same time, I got to be on set a fair bit and I watched them shooting the House of Wax movie. And obviously, as Mm. as an aspiring cinematographer, I was fascinated by what the the cinematographer on that movie was doing and the setups Mm. and the massive lighting and... So the Paris Hilton was a, a that was sort of the means to, to to earning some money, but it meant that I could get on set, which is where I ultimately wanted to be. So I got to see them making the movie, and I and I loved it. And I had a friend who was the assistant to the director on that movie, so I kind of had a little bit of an in there, and it, it was just great to to watch them construct this this movie. Um, mm. And it was just a very surreal experience for me because I was, you know, sort of hanging out with Paris, so to speak. And at that time, in the early 2000s, she was everywhere, as you probably remember. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. It, was all, it, it was all Paris. And, and to be kind of one-on-one with her. And she was actually really, honestly, she was really lovely. And she understood what I was trying to do when we were doing our bits to camera and all mm. that sort of stuff. And she was very easy to work with in that way because she understood... Her image was important, and and, um, and I was there to capture that. So she'd always wait till I was in the best position to shoot, um, which sounds a bit wrong. But um, it was, <laughs> I, I, I remember you telling me that that she was incredibly was m- media savvy. She knew she knew how to manipulate the camera. She knew what a shot was. She basically she, a director, <laughs> probably. Yeah, you're not wrong. Yeah, because she'd done all those reality shows, and so she would have seen how they put them together. So she was directing me. You know, we'd be on a We'd be at a party, a Playboy party, and we'd be, you know, getting into the elevator, and she'd be giving me directions on the shots and how she'd like it to be covered. And, That's and insane. I, and I was just like, "This is great. This is what direct. <laughs> yeah. A lot of directors don't don't do. They don't quite." She was very, she was very clear about what she wanted, so it was really easy to work with her. But uh, I mean, I got yeah. to see the, the, the making of the movie. And, but to go back to the other part of the question, I mean, horror to me has never been sort of the be all and end all of, of, of what I wanted to do as a as a as a filmmaker as a, or as a cameraman. Yeah. But I do have very vivid memories of the first video I ever watched on our on our parents' VHS machine was a film called Wacko, which I don't know if you know about, but it was about a lawnmower killer, uh, <laughs> and it was the VHS that was given to us when we bought the video player. And <laughs> I'll, I'll never forget as like a 10-year-old kid watching this terrible, 
horror film about a lawn mower killer and called Wacko. But, um, but you know, Nightmare on Elm Street, all those sort of classics played a big part in my childhood with sleepovers and video. You know, video nights were just such a big thing back then. And, yeah. And yeah. horror films were generally sort of the go-to, like, let's all get scared, let's all cuddle up, you know, in the sleeping bags on the uh, by the by the couch and, and 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 so they were without me realizing it they were kind of a big part of my sort of early movie going kind of experience yeah yeah cool. sure so just pairing it back simon for for those who don't know what 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 do you do on set what does a cinematographer do exactly well the cinematographer is the author of the image as, as far as what's captured by the camera and that involves everything from figuring out the lighting of a scene, figuring out the camera movement, figuring out the lenses and the angles, but also it's it's about working with the director and, and kind of establishing a, a visual style that that's going to be consistent and to be able to create a style or create a consistent visual style that that the audience doesn't really kind of they shouldn't be aware of but Mm. it has an impact without them being aware of it you know you think of the favorite films like the thing i was talking to you about john carvin as the thing i mean that's love that film. such a beautifully such a beautifully shot movie the lighting in that is something that i would you know i would aspire to make anything that looks as good as that and um so yeah it's 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 such a huge job um and it's not just about pressing go on the camera it's it's about creating it's about working with everybody and creating that mm. that image that ultimately the audience gets to see, but they don't understand what's sort of the thought that's gone behind that. Like, why are we shooting it this way? It's because we've worked with the director and the designer and everyone to figure that out. Yeah. Paul and I are massive fans I, of the, the, the Devil's Candy. The one thing that both Paul and I did say when we saw it is that the story's pretty good. It's pretty... It's, pretty, it's not super complicated. But the beauty yeah. of it was that it was directed so well and the cinematography is really great. And we did say, Paul and I did say, yeah. if we didn't know who shot it, we would have come away saying, my God, that was really shot really, really well and directed really, really well. For me, I'm like, I'm obviously each director that you work with is, is very different, but clearly you have a very good relationship with that particular director, I'm guessing. Because how, how hard did you guys yeah. work beforehand to establish every shot to get the mood? And do you have your own... Did, was, it, yeah. was, it a, was it a two-way street with you both work together or you had a very strong vision? Or was he like, I want to feel this, yeah. make it happen? How does that... How was your working relationship with him? Yeah, so oh, thank you for, for that comment, by the way. Um, mm-hmm. Devil's Candy was the second film I'd, I'd shot, the second feature. I'd done shorts with short, Sean before, um, but it was the second feature we'd done together after The Loved Ones. And The Loved Ones did well, maybe not sort of um, commercially, but it was well-regarded, well-respected in the horror communities, and it won yeah. the, the Toronto Award. and. So he, he got off to a great start, and it took him a long time to get his next film up. It's, it's really hard to find money to make movies. And, um, yeah. yeah. So when he, got, when he found the producers that were willing to make The Devil's Candy uh, in Texas, as I said before, you know, I went down there, and having worked with Sean before a couple of times meant that you know, we, we knew each other quite well, and I knew how he worked, and he knew how I worked. And the way it works with Sean is he's incredibly prepared, like he does a lot of work in, and he puts together these incredible kind of backstories to everyone's characters and he creates this incredible lookbook for ideas, for visuals, for design and costume and camera. And then, and then we just start honing it down and the two of us would literally just sit in his office every night in pre-production till 2, 3 in the morning going through all the scenes and he would have a shot list that he's created, and then I would come in and I'd say, yes, yes, no, no, yes, no, no. And he'd say, why no? Why no? Why no? And I'd say, this, this, this. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, that, that collaboration um, led to what you see on screen. And, mm-hmm. and so he's really amazing at, at having, one, having quite a clear vision, um, but also being very open to taking on board the professionals around him that have their ideas and their skill base and he and and whether it's me or the costume designer or the production designer or the producers you know he he kind of he's just a smart guy that understands movies and understands when an idea is better than what than what he might have originally kind of conceived and and so he's smart enough to take all the good bits and but we're also very aware like that was another low budget movie and so we we kind of shoot to our budget as well so we shoot in a style that kind of 
corresponds with the amount of days and time um, that we have to shoot. That's a that's a big one. Did you notice? I mean, we talk about the love. He worked collab- collaborated with Sean on the Love Ones and the Devil's Candy. Did you notice any um, any differences in his work between you know the debut feature and his sophomore feature, and, and how he went about creating um, his vision? Um, essentially, he he went through the same process because he's very much a process guy. Like he he has to kind of invest himself wholeheartedly into the script that he's written and and what he's trying to make and you know he's not the kind of guy that will be that will be sort of you know nonchalant about the smallest detail every detail yeah to some directors might be like oh don't worry about it to him it's like well the size of the rock that he kills the kid with is just as important as the the light in the field at night or how dark it should be and um, sure. Every every little detail is is probably just as important to him from one film to another. But I suppose from that first film experience, his own uh, learning curve uh, on the production side of things, or how to deal with people, or how to deal with trying to raise money, and all of that sort of stuff. I think there would have been a huge learning curve in that side of or that respect, and just the technical mm. aspects of, of getting it made and post-produced. But when it comes to actually creating the the, the, the film that we're shooting, it, he's just as, if not more, um, sort of detailed than, than he was to start with. Wow. That's, that's yeah, cool. With um, the loved ones, you, you mentioned about how it may not have been kind of a, a received a critical standing ovation, but it did gangbusters on in the, the horror circuit with uh, bands of horror, yeah. and it's developed something of a cult following, you know, like in a big way. You hear if you go on any kind of um, online chatter and mention mm. the loved ones, it's always dealt with in a, with high praise. Were you surprised by that kind of reaction at all? I, I still remember seeing the very first. Um rough cut of that movie at a cinema where they have, you know, they have an audience full of people that don't don't know what they're about to watch and they have to fill out forms at the end of it. Yes. Uh, while they're still in the editing process, so it's not a finished film. But I still remember sitting there and watching it that night in that cinema in Melbourne and and watching it thinking, wow, this is fucking amazing. Like, this is... <laughs> This is kind of all. This has all come together in a way that's better than I imagined. I mean, I knew we had good ideas, and I knew that there was a pretty original kind of take on a, on the prom queen kind of um, teen movie there. But um, I just felt it straight away that night, even though there were problems and the screening actually wasn't that great with all the feedback. But I, I still remember that feeling, and I thought. Yeah, yeah, this is this is good. Like, this is actually cool. This is if this is where it's at right now before it's finished, then this is going to be really good. And whether that translates to financial success, no. But I could see that it was going to be a hit with with horror lovers. And Sean was mm. or is such a, a horror fanatic and and understands the genre better than most. I mean, he's probably. I mean, you guys would probably have a great conversation because you've probably got much more kind of knowledge about that genre than I do, but he's got a great understanding of it, but he also mm. knows what an audience likes. And his his mantra to me was always, um, if they don't care, they don't scare. And so we would always kind of keep that in the back yes. of our heads. It's a great comment. You've got to, you've got to have... You've got to have the audience invested in the characters to care about them before they'll scare. And so um, yes. that that's kind of one of his greatest strengths as a director, I think, is is getting that that sort of story and, and character human side of things before he starts to really fuck with people's heads. <laughs> yes. So, Simon, you've worked now, you, you're, you're, in, you're in the big leads, you've made feature films, you've come from a um, you know videography background, you've done TVC commercials with some really cool people, I might add. Um, yeah, and, awesome. <laughs> and video clips. <laughs> I mean, is it is a are you and now you're delving into the Hollywood side of things? Are you finding that the filmmakers there, the directors there, uh, they're a different kettle of fish, or every just basically any director you work with is is just the individual person? You've got to figure out their quirks and yourself too. Have you how how have you evolved as a cinematographer? Well, thank you. I, I certainly don't feel like I'm in the big leagues, but uh, it, it's it's you're it's, about uh, to do it's, Doctor it's, Who. <laughs> I'm about to do Doctor Who, yes. Um, look, I, no, I feel like, I mean, even with, the, even with the directors I'm working with here on these big American shows, I mean, they're all different. They're all exactly the same and different than all the directors I've worked with. You know, they're all passionate or 
Some have got a greater visual sense than others. Some have got a better character sense. Some have got a, a great ed- editing brain, and some have got a great character brain. Like they're all they're all kind of different, but they've all got the one thing in common, which is they're passionate about making movies or making great TV. I just worked with Kevin Smith on um, on The Flash, and you know, there's a director that's made films that I've loved for years, and now I'm working with him. And, mm, how was that? Um, he he was. He was one of the loveliest guys you'll ever meet, and the crew absolutely adored him. But he understood what he was making, you know, this TV show, and yeah. he knows he knows superhero genre. He knows he's such a fan himself, so he would just get excited every every day, and <laughs> and you felt that as a crew member, you you sort of fed off it. Yeah. Whereas some people are so yeah. in their own minds and they're so kind of in for their own thoughts that that actually doesn't. Uh, inspire a crew as much, but when you've got someone that's kind of just loving what they're doing and like, wow, look what we're doing, man! We're going to make someone fly today. We're working with the Flash, there's Supergirl, there's, you know, and, and you sort of get that excited feeling. And it's like, it's, I, I'm like that working over here. I'm still the the kid in the candy store, kind of going, wow, I'm, I'm working on some big stuff. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, only a few years ago, working on super low budget stuff in Australia and whatever, and it's not that I like either better or worse, but it's just, it's kind of cool just to see all the sides to um, to filmmaking and, and, you know, I'm not even close to the big leagues as you might want to say, but um, <laughs> I, I feel like it will probably be the same shooting Star Wars, you know, I reckon there'd be fans and, and you just shoot it one day at a time, one shot at a time, just like yeah. you and I, just like you and I and shot all those commercials. <laughs> yeah. Exactly the same. Exactly same, the same. It's all the same. Exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's all the same. The first thing we worked on, we were kicking footballs at the Sydney Football Stadium from memory. Yeah. That's so that, right. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. Cool. yeah. No, but it's the same. It's yeah, exactly it the same. It's the same conversations. How yeah. do we make this work? How do we shoot this? How are we going to get that many people? We don't. We can't afford more than 30 people. Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's what it's what it's done for me is real is made me realize that you know that it is it is kind of universal this filmmaking stuff it doesn't matter what country you're in um yeah. you're trying to get the same thing would you say Keep kicking those balls to get the job done we were well Sorry. yeah <laughs> yeah we, uh, the last the last face to face conversation i had with chappy i was teaching him how to hit a forehand in tennis uh, that's right <laughs> whilst we're waiting for Eddie Maguire to come on set so anyway that's right <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> so nice. would you say Chappie I mean how much over the years have you gotten self aware about what you tend to prefer as a DOP and, and or do you try to be as malleable as possible and you fit your your shooting style to whatever the, the, the genre is or whatever the director is trying to do because I say I like, this because uh, yeah. real quickly I, the, the thing I love about The Devil's Candy is that you, you compose a lot of beautiful shots that are very still um, yeah, there's yes, not a yes. lot of extravagant camera movement and I don't know how much that was limited to budget if it was for me it was a great example yeah. of somebody adapting to say okay you know what we can't move the camera let's just give you an image that makes you go oh fuck that's yeah. really interesting and a lot of the shots you did compose yeah. were like oh my god that's a really cool shot um, but anyway so yeah. back to the question how much you know well, how much is you over the, over the course of the years that you've worked how much have you started to develop your own style or do you prefer to be a chameleon thank you um, yeah with the Devil's Candy I mean you're right that, that was part of it like, that was part of the the, 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 um, the aesthetic approach was um, uh, let's Let's use the fact that we don't have all the whiz bang tools, but create something that's more still and more kind of affected by not moving the camera. Mm. And when we do move the camera, then it means more than, you know, if we were doing the Michael Bay kind of just every shot's a tracking shot, every shot's this movement, and that's fine. But I think it starts to lose its kind of impact if you just keep doing the same thing, unless it's unless it's kind of like a Kubrick version of that where it's. A symmetrical kind of tracking, yes. or it's, mm. you know, and it has a sort of pulse to itself. So, yes. I think Sean and I, Sean and I, definitely um, took that on board and, and used that as part of that aesthetic. But, but um, I don't know. I think as as I keep working and shooting, I'm I'm developing my own voice as as a DP for sure. But I also mm. like to think I'm not a one style fits all cameraman. Like there's there's guys out there that sort of adapt the same look to every shoot that they do because that's just what they like Mm. whereas I feel like you know every job is different and based on the story and the script and the director you should be able to 
kind of adapt your style or your look to, to fit that particular movie. I just I want to backtrack a bit to talk about Griff the Invisible. I know it's not um, oh. I know it's not I know it's not a horror film. But, oh my um, God. I wanted to men- mention it because of Ryan Quantin, who uh, oh, yeah. people might know from uh, True Blood. Oh, and, De- and Dead Silence as well. So he's kind of no stranger to the ho- horror circuit. I, I yeah. was really fortunate to I- interview him uh, some six, seven years ago now, and um, was a really nice guy. So I just kind of was interested in um, in your take on him as a as an actor and. And obviously, yeah. he's made waves in um, in America, and as as has um, Robin McLevy from uh, The Loved yeah. Ones. So just a comment on, on you know Ryan, but also the wave of uh, great talent that Australia has that's kind of making an impact across the yeah. scenes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, um, it's, I'm glad you mentioned Griff the Invisible. That that was one of my first movies, and that that was a real learning curve, you know, on all fronts mm. for all of us making that. You know, I made a lot of mistakes on that movie, and. Um, but I mean, that's just part of learning your craft, isn't it? And, but we were yeah. really lucky to have Ryan Quantin because he was, um, sort of coming off true blood or he was still sort of in that. And it, that was a huge show at that mm. time. And I remember just walking with him through Centennial Park or wherever we were shooting. And there was these girls that were just going absolutely mental for him when they saw him. <laughs> and I, I didn't realize, I didn't realize at that time just how sort of big, that show was and and um but also just being yeah. around a celebrity that was you know just getting a taste of what what they what they have to deal with um yes but he was he was incredibly professional and and yeah. hard working and was great because he had that television experience he, it meant that he was just very technically aware and i remember mm-hmm. it didn't seem to matter what we threw at him with with the camera he would sort of get what we were doing like he was one of those actors which i've noticed there are sort of half of the actors are really technically aware and half the actors are sort of in their own sort of little world and they want to go back to their trailer and they don't care about the, the, the sort of the making of the, the film. But mm. Ryan's one of those guys who's obviously been on the set and watching every single person and how they do their job and how the directors make. I feel like he'd be one of those actors that'll be a director one day for sure. Yeah, um, yeah. So he was awesome. But, and Robin McLeavy and The Loved Ones was just, I mean, that was one of the best performances, I think, of all time, like she yeah. get much much more recognition for that for that role as Lola than than she gets. Yeah. Um, but again, like she was she was so cool, and, and there were moments on the loved ones where where I'd be lighting a scene, and um, she'd be sitting in the corner of the set, like where the the farmhouse sort of kitchen room is, where where they torture the the, the kid, and um, yes. Robin Robin would just look at me, and I'd catch her eye, and she. would She'd kind of give me this big smile and just say, hi, Simon, like, in her character. character, And it would scare the hell out of me. (laughs) Shit. And the crew knew it because I'm very sensitive to the actors and and just their performances. And I think that's a part of the cinematography role that no one quite gets is that you're you're so close to these, these actors when they're performing, when the camera's cut and you're the one person that they're seeing, um, Mm-hmm. So you get you get very attached to them and protective, but then when you've got Robin McLeavy, Robin McLeavy as Lola, sort of looking at you with this maniacal grin, and and, it, and it, it's it, it's effective. I still remember feeling kind of freaked out by it, <laughs> even though I know I can see it. Yeah. It's, not real. <laughs> it's not real, Simon. It's all make believe. Yeah. So just on that note too, though. So speaking of um. Uh, quality actors and bringing back the, the Devil's Candy again. I mean, working with Pruitt Taylor Vince must, must have been an awesome kind of experience. Yeah. Like, it's, you know, and he can just kind of uh, do the, the, the most <laughs> su- subtle, subtle <laughs> movement. Yeah. And it's freaky yeah. as fuck. Um, what was so that good. like, working with that relationship with him? He was, he was good. He was good. I, I mean, Sean really fought hard to get him because... He's amazing. Mm. The, char- amazing. The, yeah. the character was, it was, it was... The character that Sean had written was such a particular look and he knew that yes. uh, Pruitt would have that ability, not only the look of it, but the ability. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen Heavy, the film that he... One of his best performances. But um, yes. that was what... Sh- Sean actually had to write him a letter to, to sort of convince him to come and do this movie, and you know, and that and it worked. Um, yeah. And so, you know, Pruitt's not obviously not the most physically able person, but his uh, 
his performance ability is unsurpassed and and mm. having him on set and I he wasn't he wasn't sort of method or anything like that so I could very quickly go and just chat to him about working on movies and and the people that he's worked with and he loved to to recount stories of, of famous people that he's worked with and directors and whatnot. Uh, yeah. So yeah, it was it was great to have that. Oops, sorry, it was great to have that experience working with him. Uh, and and Sean Sean really pushed him out of his comfort zone a lot of the time. And so it, I think it was a challenge for Pruitt. I think I think the whole film was challenging on a few different levels. So, it, but again, you know, you watch it and you think, oh yeah, I can't imagine anyone else playing Ray. Yeah. Yeah. I've always wondered Absolutely. how does he do that thing with his eyes? Is that just something he doesn't? He's not aware of, or he consciously can do it? Yeah. Yeah, it's just something that he can do. That's it's insane. Incredible. <laughs> Actually, I've always wanted to ask you about horror because it fascinates me and Paul from the filmmaking process. Because Paul and I are in a comedy group, and so we wear comedy skits, and the whole thing, yeah. yeah, and the whole thing is like, is this funny? And sometimes it is, and sometimes we think it is, and sometimes it isn't. And, and the interesting yeah. thing about comedy and horror is that you're trying to tap into a primeval sort of emotion. So end of the day do you do you find yourself because i know filmmaking is that you shoot out of order it's all you know out of context and there's like a thousand people outside the frame and they're trying to get a shot do you, is there a time do you sit in the chair and think oh my god is this going to be scary yeah def- definitely definitely i think um making a horror is not scary i mean the content is rarely scary when you're when you're shooting it i mean there are moments when things a little bit freaky and you think oh wow that's that's a cool moment that's definitely going to work because that that kind of affected me a little bit um but for the most part the ho- the horror is about the construction and the construction is yes. it's a bit like and this is a terrible analogy but it's like shooting shooting sex scenes on film is anything but sexy yeah. like shooting sex sex scenes is so technical and awkward and um it's just like no one really wants it no one really wants to do it, but it's like, well, we've got it, but the actor's awkward, and it's like, well, we'll shoot it this way, and then we'll shoot it that way, and it'll be fine. It's a little bit like that. I mean, you, you're sort of, you're, the ingredients are all there, and you think, okay, well, we're going to get that moment, and that's going to be bloody, and that's going to be this, and we know from our pre-production that the sequence will cut together like this, but when you're shooting it, as you said, it's all out of order, so... Often it's it's anything but scary. The scariest part is actually just trying to get it shot, and it's like, man, what the fuck are we doing? Like we've got four <laughs> hours, and we've got to sh- we've got to shoot this entire scene where he comes through the door and he shoots up the hallway and he gets shot and he falls down and then he walks up the stairs and he starts pouring gasoline on the stairs. Like it's 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 like horrific in the, yes. in, the in the making of it because how the hell do we get that many shots in this amount of time? But then. When you see it put together, you're like, oh, okay, so thankfully our forward planning and our design has kind of worked and they put some music under it and, and the scares are there. Um, but, yeah, so it's a little bit of, a, it's a little bit of an unknown. You, you kind of trust in your instincts and, and your gut feeling and, and it's like, well, that didn't feel right, so let's do it this way. And Sean, again, as a director, he, he understands the genre better than anyone, so you'd sort of just trust that, that he knew what he was getting and... and um, and, and it would work, but yeah, it's it's rarely scary on set. It's normally just sort of uh, painful. <laughs> mm, mm. I remember in the loved ones, like there was a moment where at the end of the film in the kitchen, where the, where Lola's daddy or daddy's character's name's daddy gets stabbed in the neck by Xavier uh, Samuel. Yeah. He just gets stabbed, stabbed, and the blood's just pouring everywhere. And all, all I can think of, well, even when I watch it now, is just a little bit to the left of frame. Who I'm trying to keep out of frame. Is the guy pumping the blood <laughs> through, through the little through the little hose that's coming out of the prosthetic, and this guy's yes. getting an, annoyed, and John Brumpton, the actor's getting annoyed because he's like he's hot and bothered, and he's getting angry, and and not angry in an unprofessional way, but just like frustrated. And I'm just trying to, and I'm just thinking, man, I'm getting fucking blood all over my body, <laughs> like. I'm just concerned that my clothes, no one's covered me. In it's the level of, of, of filmmaking. And then you watch it and you're yeah. like, well, that's a horrific scene. And everyone's affected by it. And I still get affected by a lot of scenes and I don't remember how we made it. And I'm just as engaged as the audience. But then occasionally there's those moments where I'm like, I remember how painful it was to shoot that. Oh, my God. I, I do want to, we haven't touched on yeah. the um, killing, killing talk, ground Yeah, yet. we should definitely talk about that, yeah. 
you, you seem to be hitting decent home runs for Australian cinema when it comes to the horror genre kind of scene. <laughs> um, and um, I do want to talk about um, Killing Ground because it's both chilling and disturbing. Uh, mm. More importantly, I wanted to talk about the direction that you were given for this film and how you were able to convey that sense of feeling trapped in what is essentially and um, primarily shot and in this exterior environment. Um, mm. Because that's something that really st- stuck with me um, when I was watching the film. Yeah, I, it, it was a challenge, uh, that's for sure. I mean, we, knowing the whole film was set around a campsite and, and a sort of an, uh, an isolated area, but how to do that in a way that's kind of convincing. And uh, again, working with Damien, who, who directed that, you know, we'd, we'd shot a lot of shorts together, and, and he's another mm. another Tasmanian like Sean, actually. Uh, they seem to understand this genre pretty well. And <laughs> it's very cold down there. They've got nothing else to think about. Those crazy <laughs> things, eh? Um, he, he'd been with that script for a long time, or for a while, and, and had and sort of understood how he wanted it to, to translate that to, to film. And, um, yeah, again, you know, we, we sat down and worked together on that a lot, and that they found the location eventually, which a film like that, the location really dictated a lot of what we were doing, and we tried to find particular areas within the bush environment that we were in uh, for each scene that would relate to. But, yeah, Damien had a very clear vision about um, the isolation and it was much more sort of a... It was a very realistic horror. I know that's a terrible mm. way to describe it. It's a, sort of a boring way to describe it, but a bit like Funny Games or that, that sort of Michael Haneke, yes. that, that style of... Oh wow! This yes. is not just this is not a boogeyman in a mask. Like this is this could be real guys, and this is a real family, and this is going to be some pretty messed up stuff. So it was already mm. a risk, I think, making that movie like that because it's 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 easy to kind of get away with the the, the man in the mask kind of um, horror in a way that's not as so easy with the that that very realistic brutal realism um, that that he was going for with with Killing Ground. Yeah. Um, but he just stuck to his guns. You know, he kept saying, look, this is my first film. I've got one chance to make an impact. I may as well just go balls to the wall and just do it as as intense as I can make it and just try and get away with yeah. what I can get away with. And, and it kind of worked, you know. We went to Sundance and he got he got a great reception there and he got an agent and his whole life has changed because of it. Um, but, but, yeah, from, from a construction point of view, very similar to Sean in, in that sense of, you know, this is this is kind of a way I think we can achieve this with our budget and our time, and um, yeah, you know, yeah. keep, keep it keep it simple and just make it about the characters. And, and if the audience is is kind of with them, then they'll go with with us. Yeah, one hundred percent. Like I said, it's one and thing. And we that also really... sorry to interrupt. We we sorry yeah. to interrupt. We just didn't want to make it the the grungy handheld um, kind of stuck in the bush outback. I don't know how to. You know what I mean? Like it was. Let's, yeah. let's, yeah. let's try and let's try and keep it grounded and simplified and elegant as we can, even though there's all this horrific shit going on. That'll that'll be our signature. That'll be our look. You know, let's 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 not go um, desaturated and have, let's embrace the bush. Let's embrace the light and that kind of thing. So, which which That's helped great. make it feel even more realistic. If we'd gone for a very sort of Hollywood desaturated horror look, I think that instantly would have just put it in that like category and people wouldn't have been with us yes absolutely all i was going to say was that aaron peterson is amazing in that some of the looks that he gives is oh chilled you to the bone he's like yeah amazing amazing performer um did you have anything else to add there Ant, at all on on Uh, any questions or no i'll I'll ask industry related questions which might which would bore the audience but like all these filmmakers (laughs) you're working with it sounds like they have even though they've as far as the public is concerned, they've come out of nowhere. But like you and Gavin, yeah. they they have done the hard yards and they have worked really hard to get with that, honing yeah. their craft. Like you have, I guess. I mean, I mean, if you want to take it to an industry question, for any aspiring cinematographer who listens to this podcast, what would be <laughs> your, yeah. your biggest advice to them, man? Because um, uh, that's a big one. I think um, I think you just have to try and align yourself with the directors that you want to work with, and and align yourself to the projects that you want to put your name to, like. After the loved ones and the devil's candy and now killing ground, like I get offered quite a lot of um, horror. Like there's no mm. doubt about it. I get sent a lot of scripts, 
And to be honest, I say no to 99.9% of them because they're, they're terrible. Like, there's a lot of people out yeah. there that want to, want to make horror films, but I just think, man, unless, unless it's something, you know, pretty original or if it's someone that I know, like one of these guys, um, mm. I don't, I don't want to just now in my career, like early on, I was just like, yeah, I just want to shoot everything because that's how you get your experience. And, and I think it's important to just yeah. sort of put yourself out there and just shoot whatever you can to, to learn. But I feel like now in this part of my career, it's about being choosy and, and choosing the right projects and, and aligning yourself with the projects that, that sort of, um, are, are close to where you want to see. Like I look at myself and I think, what kind of movies do I want to shoot eventually? And if mm. I'm just shooting, if I'm just shooting one particular style or one particular genre, um, uh, you, you've got to be very selective, I think. So yes. um, there's no, there's no harm in being selective, but uh, if you want to shoot commercials, then just pursue commercials. If you just want to shoot um, drama, then pursue drama, but uh, you know, know, know where it is that you want to go and, and, and mm. align align yourself with the right people if you can. So, so what's um, what, what's on the horizon for you at the moment? And we were talking about Doctor Who and things like that. Um, uh, yeah. But what's hap- what's happening with your world away from uh, the Flash and things like that? What's what's? It's a good question. I've, I've just I've been sort of immersed in the world of television recently. I shot a, a series, in a, two series in Australia this year um, or last year. Uh, one was a television movie uh, about the Easy Beats, and that was with a director that I really wanted to meet. That's why I chose that. Um, that was Matt mm, Cool. Cool. Um, yes. So, I, I, again, that's why I mean, like, I chose to go back to Australia to shoot that show because of him. That's a director that I wanted to work with. And then I just recently mm. shot half of the series called Harrow for the ABC. Um, again, three new directors that I really wanted to work with. And so that was great. Um, so television is definitely a big part of it, the future. Mm. Um, I want to make movies, but uh, in the short term, television is, is much more viable and there's just a lot more of it being being made. Yeah. I would love to shoot high-end quality dramatic television. Like That would be like Fargo's or, or Game of Thrones, yeah, things yes. like that. I mean, yeah. that, it's, 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 the, it's the pinnacle of that genre, but why not? Why not strive for it? Um, so I'm off to shoot Doctor Who um, in a couple of weeks, which will be great, and that's yeah. a show that how, I've, I've how, loved for a, for a long time. Yeah, how did you, how did you get that, if you can ask? That was with a director that I know from Sydney who got the, the job, and she um, wow. she requested. Yeah, so Doctor Who's great. They, they um, Each director shoots directs a couple of episodes, and they can choose their DP of choice. Oh, and, wow. Um, cool. I, I'm fortunate enough to have a UK passport, and uh, and I was like, yeah. Uh, I'd love to, and you know, there's a whole new doctor, as you know. Yep. Yes. Um, they're shooting. They're shooting on a whole new format. I've just seen episode one. Really? And, um, and it's <gasps> it's brilliant. Yeah. Good. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, I've got. Looks I've, good. Is good. I've got. I've got three episodes right here with me right now. And, I'm uh, just going to play them right now for the audience. Just. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. So I would never. <laughs> <no>. word, <laughs> so are they new format? Are they shooting 4K? Are they or, or something like that? They're shooting anamorphic. Animal- so, oh wow! Um, okay. Dang. So it looks like a, it, every episode looks like a big movie, and the new Doctor's great. There's a whole new team around her. It's 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 mm-hmm. it's pretty yeah. cool. So yeah, it's 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 cool, and and I'm looking forward to you know um, sort of diving into that world of just reading scripts at the moment. And yeah, <laughs> so I'll be off off in a couple of weeks. That's fantastic, man. You've done so well. It's really really cool. Thank you, mate. <laughs> it is a little bit surreal sometimes. You think, oh, I'm not. I think we all do in this industry in our careers. We we're like, oh. I'm not doing what I want to do. I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. Yeah. And then yeah, occasionally yeah. I go, well, hang on. Let's look at what I have done. And you know, it's not it's not too bad. But I think we're all we're all such I don't know. We're all trying to achieve so much. You kind of you don't you don't ever you don't ever see it for what it is. That is very very true. Yeah yeah, one step at a time. <laughs> Absolutely. Look, um, I think we're probably kind of at a point where we'll need to wrap up the uh, the podcast for this. But um, look, Simon, it's been awesome chatting with you. Um, and and uh, to reiterate what Ant said, you've kind of um, been hitting some decent home runs over the last few years, and it's um, you know you can really see the quality that you bring to each of those films. And I wish you every success in um, and uh, whatever kind of comes your way down the track. And just want to say. 
thank you so much for chatting with us. It's been been an it's awesome really cool. insight. We can keep talking no for, for ages. I, guess, I think people could remember that. Man. We could. Yeah, yeah. I, I got to say yeah. too, like I've worked, I've worked with amazing cinematographers in the short form community. Chappy was always. The thing that made Chappy Chappy was that not only did he have a great eye compared to, with compared to like some other cinematographers, but he was the most easygoing guy. <laughs> everybody, everybody loves working with Chappy because Chappy's a happy Chappy. Oh, thank you, happy Chappy. That was thank the one thing. Know. I mean, I, that was my advice to cinematographers. Um, not only do you have to be good at your game, like Simon is, but if you're good to work with, then you know it, it helps. It helps. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. I appreciate those words. Uh, no, that's very kind. Oh, it's true, man. You, you, you got a black belt in cinematography, but you're a nice guy about. It. <laughs> you're a nice guy about. It. I'll, I'll be knocking on your door for a job soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you probably have to tell security at Doctor Who that there's an Asian guy looking for you. Because I, I might be, I might be flying over sometime <laughs> soon. I better get a photo for you. Eh? I'm going to be. Man, you've got to get a selfie and a, and a signed autograph. Well, yeah, yeah Paul, will. Paul and I are massive fans. Oh. I'll, I'll, Absolutely. Sure, I'll try and get you one for sure. Oh, uh, that's awesome. Right, well, we, cool. should, we should probably do this again sometime, Paul, like a follow-up sequel. Anytime. Heaps more questions. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I'll love follow up when I'm, when I'm back. Yeah, yeah, cool, man. Yeah, so that's kind of us for uh, the podcast. Um, just once again, thank you. I'm your host, Paul Farrell, joined by my co-host, Anthony, and our guest uh, podcaster interviewee, uh, Simon Chapman. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Goodbye. guys. Thanks, guys. Awesome yeah. chat. You're listening to the Surgeons of Horror Podcast. Music supplied by Peter Nezik. For more discussions or podcasts, head over to surgeonsofhorror.com or head over to our Facebook and Twitter sites for the latest news and updates.